Dear Lord, we thank you for um, Jacob. We thank you for um, giving him as your servant to um, lead us and teach us. Just pray for the words you've given him this morning. Lord, may they fall on listening ears. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, John. Good morning. I'm really excited, excited to start this new series called Faces of Service. And what we're going to do each week is we're going to look at a different individual and look at where they are in life and see how they serve God from where they are. Today we have this young girl, a servant to Naaman's wife, and we're going to see how God uses her powerfully from where she is, a place of a servant, to speak truth and to bring about change where she is. I want to start this morning and introduce the series with this image of braided rope. And you see each of these individual colored strands here is small on its own, but as it's woven with the other strands, it forms something larger, more beautiful, as it's brought together with the others. I think this is a really important image for us to keep in mind throughout this entire series, Faces of Service, because really the series is about how God takes each one of us as an individual strand and brings us and weaves us together as we are a church community, as we are the body of Christ, and is something larger and much more beautiful than we are as individuals. I was thinking about that today as Julie and Sarah and Charmaine were up here singing, and their voices were mixing together, and then the voices of each one of us in the congregation were mixing with their voices into this beautiful chorus of, to God and worship to God. I want to give you an example of this concept, and I want to use um, one of Paul's passages. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture about being co-workers, and it's from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And Paul says, When one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? So basically Paul's saying, when somebody says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. For we are co-workers in God's service. We are co-workers in God's service. And if you take this word co-workers and you go down here, the actual Greek word for it, sunergeo, or sunergeos, it means those who work together with someone, cooperate, become a co-worker or a fellow laborer, to help, to aid, to contribute to an end or a goal. We get our English word, are you going to guess what it is, what I say here? What's our synergy from this Greek word? If you look at our English word synergy, it means the interaction or cooperation of two or more organizations, substances, or other agents to produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects. A combined effect that is greater than their individual parts. So Paul, Apollos, Cephas, we could substitute other names in there that we could think of over the years. Menno Simons, Martin Luther, John Wesley. We could think of people that we know who have shaped us coming into this body of Christ. Mary Hirschberger. You could think of Floyd Muma. And all of these individuals come together into the body of Christ into something far greater than they are as individuals. And we need to remember that as we go into this series, Faces of Service. This is what God wants to do with the church. And if we listen to our passage carefully today, we're going to be able to re-examine some of our thinking about church, some of the misconceptions we have about church. And we're going to be able to think about our church culture a little bit differently. We're going to be able to think about some of the things about our church culture that get in the way of mission inadvertently, put up roadblocks to mission, we're going to be able to think about some things in our own thinking that keep us from entering into the plan God has for us as a body. So let's go a little deeper and see how we can uh, do this. Paul goes on further later in 1 Corinthians to give us this image of the body and the many gifts. 
Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. And can you read this with me, if you would, starting here at the word just? Just as a body, the one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. Now, that last line is so profound, and I hope we'll really hear that for ourselves today. God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. So translate, God has put you where you are in life, where you are in the church, in this particular time, for a specific purpose that he has for you to fulfill with your gift, just as he's wanted it to be, just as he's done with every single strand in the cord. There's a real purpose behind us being here today as church. Each one of us is here for a reason today, and God has done that with a plan and a goal and a vision in mind. So with, with that in the back of our minds, I want us to jump into our passage today and think about this small girl and the voice that she has in the story. Now, I just want to highlight a few things about her, and you might be asking the question, where in the wor- world does this term Na'ara come from? Did anybody else wonder that? Where did this term Na'ara come from? Okay, several of you wondered that. I'm glad. I did that on purpose. Um, this series we're going to be looking at, Faces of Service, every single person in this series has a name except for our character today. She's just referred to in our English translation as a young girl. So I was thinking, how can we personalize this story a little bit more? And then I, as I was reading the passage again, I was looking at it, and I looked at it in the Hebrew text, and it says, and I have it here in yellow here, they had taken captive a young girl and when she's referred to as a young girl in the Hebrew, they say Na'ara. She's referred to as Na'ara in the Hebrew text. So I thought, when we talk about her, let's call her Na'ara. That's what she's called in the Hebrew text. So they took her captive away from her land of Israel. She's brought as a foreigner into this place of the Arameans, into Syria. And there she serves. She has a low position. Um, she's a girl from Israel. And in that low position, she is used in our story today by conveying that message that she offers up to Naaman that ultimately leads to his healing. This is what she says here in the middle. If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So she has the courage to speak. She has the courage, even though she is servant, to step forward and put herself out there and to give this suggestion to, to travel to Israel to meet Elisha and to seek this healing. So I want to just think about how hard that would be. Think about Na'ara, this young girl. In the text, it calls her a Na'ara Katan. So Na'ara is a girl, and Katan means small or little. So it's not just that she's a girl, but she's little, young, very young girl. This is the one artist's depiction of how young she'd be, but just open and willing to speak a word that could be helpful to Naaman. This here is the artist's depiction of Naaman's wife. If he were to travel to Israel and seek help from the prophet Elisha, he could be healed, is what she says. And I want us to contrast Naara with Naaman himself. And just think about the characters in the story a little bit. What do we know about Naaman? He's a commander. He's called a great man. It's interesting, in the Hebrew, the word for great, gadol, can mean big. So Na'ara is a little girl, and in the Hebrew, Naaman is a big man. This contrast here, he's highly regarded, he's a valiant soldier, and here he is traveling to Israel, taking the advice of this young girl. God uses this young girl to change Naaman's circumstances, to bring healing to him, but not after several circuitous loops and circles and places we weren't sure if the healing was going to come. Do you remember, Naaman begins to doubt and he's frustrated 
his pride is hurt when Elisha sends a servant to him and tells him to bathe in the river, and he's almost not going to do it. And who is it that helps him to actually follow through with the plan? Who is it in the story that helps him? His own servants. This, this story is great because it reverses the typical roles of power. It's not the king of Israel who gives him the good advice or his own king. It's his servants who say, you should really try it. What do you have to lose by bathing in the river? So we have Na'ara, the captive, the young girl, the small girl who's a servant, and we have Naaman, who's this commander. He's great, he's big, he's highly regarded. And God chooses to bless this person, to change this person through this person. Now there's a pattern here, if we're open to it, that is important for church ministry. And so I'm going to suggest it to us right now. There's two ways of viewing ministry. And this is what Paul was getting at in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that I opened with. Paul said in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Some say, I follow Paul. Others say, I follow Apollos. So the idea is, for these people, there's some central figure who's very important, and if you just follow them, everything's going to be all right. Everything's going to work out well. But Paul pr- proposes a different model. He said, no, it's not Paul or Apollos who are big, and you all need to follow us. It's we all together in Christ are co-workers. Each of us has a gift. Remember he said later in the chapter, each of us has something to contribute, and God's intentionally made the body of Christ that way. So the value of this is, if in the first model, the way of viewing ministry, it's kind of a one-way model. It's like if, if people are viewing ministry is centered around a really gifted expert or individual like Paul or Apollos, then everybody points to them to get their reference of what to do, where to go, how to serve. Kind of one directional. It's more limited. What Paul's saying is we are all co-workers and God will use each one of us to communicate with one another, to encourage one another. It's a much more collaborative, dynamic way of doing ministry. So what we need to think about in the church is how do we empower our children? How do we empower our teenagers? How do we empower each person in the body to be a part of the ministry that we're doing and to have a voice and to contribute? Remember, he used Naara to speak to Naaman. And we saw the res- result of that. How much more so when he speaks to us through our youth? So I want us to think about these, these questions today and hopefully it can start stimulating our thinking as we continue to work through this series. Do changes need to happen in your thinking or in our church culture for collaborative ministry to be the norm? So is there something right now that's blocking this from happening? Is there some uh, barriers? Is there some patterns of thinking for ourselves or in our church culture that keep this reality from happening? Where all age groups are included, every member in the church has a way to plug in, their voice is heard, their gifts are affirmed and used and invited and called out, where we have mutual accountability when we speak to one another and help one another grow, help one another as we participate with God's mission in the world. There's something that's short-circuiting that. I just want to say as a side note, and this is very exciting, this sermon series today was not something that I wrote, but Leona Hurst came up with this idea. So this is an example of collaborative ministry where she came alongside me and said, I have this idea of some of these characters and how we can learn. This is what God wants to do in our midst. So what blocks and barriers to this do we find? Uh, Number two, how can we do a better job of encouraging our children and youth and serving God with their gifts? They're doing amazing things. If you were just after church to ask our youth and our children about some of the things that are going on. We, we heard a few weeks ago about the mission trip that Reed and Emmy will be taking later in the summer. That's an exciting thing. And by the way, we've, we're halfway towards raising the funds we need for their mission trip, which is great. But you can ask them about that. That's an exciting thing that they're doing. Think about Jared and all the volunteer work he did for his Eagle Scout project and the effect and the impact he had in doing that. Think about Olivia and how she's volunteered and helped out in the children's Sunday school, helping younger kids learn and participate and grow in their faith. How can we do even a better job of encouraging them in these things? Number three, what roadblocks keep us from serving God with our gifts? And are we willing on, to work on removing them? Are we committed to working on removing them with God's help? So 
I would suggest that um, roadblocks in our thinking can be things like looking to a leader who will come and have all the answers. And if we just get around that leader and that strategy, we'll be able to become a missional church. And the whole point, I'm going to go back to the strand at the beginning here. The whole point of our passage in 1 Corinthians is that mission happens in the combined work of each strand, each person in the body of Christ. So we have to get to the place where we see mission, which is God's work in the world, what he's doing, what he's changing, what he's transforming in the world. We need to see mission as something that each of us participate in every day. We wake up in the morning, we get out of bed. We're part of God's mission in the world. When we're around our family, or when we're around our coworkers. So let's remove the roadblocks that say we don't have something to give towards God's mission. Mission is our relationships. Mission is how we convey Christ's love. And as we go ahead in the weeks ahead, I pray that we will really find practical ways to remove roadblocks for thinking of ourselves as missionaries and for thinking of the culture of our church as heading in a direction that is outward focused and missional, beautifully reflecting the diversity of God's gifts in our midst. So I'd like to invite you, if you would, would you please bow your heads with me as we